All right, good morning, Crossings. How you guys doing? All right, if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter four is where we're gonna start off. Just give you fair warning, we're gonna bounce all over the book of Luke. Uh, so just be ready, but we're gonna start in, in uh, Luke chapter four. So as you get there, let me bring us all back to maybe a pretty familiar uh, experience if you're an adult in the room or maybe if you're a teenager, this is where you are right now. And that is to your very first job that you've ever had. Um, it, it's an interesting experience. For some of you, it was... Uh, it opened your eyes to a lot of things. For some of you, it was, hey, I know I'm not gonna be here very long, and so it was, you didn't really care that much, and it was, just, it was just a moment of your life. For me, uh, my first job was out of college. I did not do the jobs that my parents were like, your job is to do school. And so, uh, thankfully, I did not have to, to do that when I was a teenager, but my first job out of college taught me a lot of things, good and bad. And, and, uh, but what I did realize was it started to show me, it formed in me some belief systems um, of what life should be like as an adult, and uh, for good or bad. Uh, there are some good things about it, there's some not so good things about it, but one of the things that was not so great was it kind of set for me an expectation of what the relationship between a boss and an employee is. And uh, unfortunately, my boss in that first job was five hours away from where I was. And so it kind of showed me that that relationship is a distant relationship. Um, the communication that we had was, was not frequent because that was back well before there was Zoom meetings or FaceTime. It was just the phone. And so we would talk about maybe once a month or once every couple months. And when we did talk, it was really just metrics. It was just, hey, give me the numbers. Why are they this way, not this way? And it was just... It was just information share. And so for a long time, I just believed that that was how a boss-employee relationship was, distant, infrequent, and just information share, until I got my second job. And my second job started to reframe for me what maybe that relationship should look like, or at least could look like. You see, in my second job, which just happened to be here at Crossings, my boss was right down the hall. And so my meetings with him were face to face. And my meetings with him were frequent. And our information that we talked about went way beyond the scope of metrics. There was a part of it that was, that was metrics, of like, hey, what, what, you know, what's going on? And, but there's also the side of the conversation, of like, hey, how are you doing? At that point, I was a young dad, and so we had conversations about fatherhood and, and marriage and just how I was doing in my life. And there was also a part of the developmental process, like, hey, this is your, how we want to develop you as a pastor, and, and so here's some goals that we're getting. So we, it went beyond just metrics. And so it reshaped my view of like, oh, well, maybe the first view of, of that boss-employee relationship was not exactly the standard to set. But maybe it was more of like what this is, face-to-face, -face, frequent, in-depth conversation that is going towards a goal. And so I share that with you to say this, is that our communication with people, whether it's your boss or a friend or a family member, your communication defines the relationship. All right, what I mean by that is like when you think about your best, your favorite relationships that you have in your life, uh, maybe that's with a, a best friend, a roommate, uh, whether that's a spouse or your parents, your mom, like when you start thinking like, why is that like, how can you prove to me that that's a great relationship? Without fail, you will go to your communication patterns. How often you communicate, what you communicate about, right? That it's a two way, like, but you go to the other side, like let's look at the relationships that aren't so good. Those relationships that you're okay with just kind of letting go. And maybe for some of us, we kind of hope just go, right? Like most of you, if that's the, that relationship, it's probably an in, infrequent conversation. The, converse, the, the context and the content is probably not super engaging. And so all of a sudden we start to realize that our communication defines our relationships across the board. And I don't think our relationship with God is very different. That our communication with the Lord defines what kind of relationship we have with the Lord. And so that's what we're gonna talk about this morning is we're gonna dive into the book of Luke and we're gonna look at Jesus's communication with the Father. We're gonna watch Jesus 
his prayer life, and then we're gonna ask the question, what does this mean for us? As followers of Jesus, what can we take from this? Because if you're anything like me, you probably grew up with a little bit, um, with, with some, some models of prayer. Like for me, my model of prayer was before meals and as a 911 call, when something was, was going down and we needed some, some real help, right? Like I would exhaust all of my options before I'm like, all right, it's 911 time. All right, Lord, um, here's what's going on, as if he's not aware, right? And so, but I think the way I viewed prayer, and maybe for some of you, that's how you viewed prayer, it's kind of like my first job. It's time to redefine what prayer is. And maybe, re, and maybe just question a little bit of like, is, is what was modeled for me, is what pop culture has taught me about prayer really what the Bible teaches about prayer? And so what I wanna start with is, is two definitions. One, I wanna kind of talk really quickly about what prayer is not, and then I wanna get into a real definition of what prayer is, okay? So here's what prayer is not. It is not a magical way to manipulate God to get what you want. We do not see this in scripture as a genie in the bottle kind of thing. A.W. Tozer, a pastor and author, uh, wrote this warning to, to the church. He said, prayer among Christians is always in danger of degenerating into a glorified gold rush. Let me read that again. <laughs> prayer among Christians is always in danger of degenerating into a glorified gold rush. God, gimme, 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 gimme. Like that's, that's our tendency, is just to, is, is to drift into, God, I need this, I want this, can you do this? And I think as we look at scripture today, we're gonna see that it's more than that. It's not a box that we check to mark off good Christian for today. It's not just for grownups. In fact, the people that I know who have a prayer life that I admire, it began in their young teenage years. When they went through something, they found a friend in Jesus. And so we cultivate a prayer life, and it's not just for adults, it's not just for special Christians, it's for everybody. And the, and the third thing that it's not is it's not a transaction. All right, you, you may have heard the, the phrase, you know, we have a relationship with Jesus, not a religion, right? And, it's, and if it is, and I believe it is, I believe that the Bible teaches us that we can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so if it is a relationship, what it cannot be is a transaction, right? We have a transaction with Amazon Prime. Like that is a transactional relationship. We have a transactional relationship with the gas pump. We give them money, they give us gas, right? That's a transactional relationship and that's all that it is. You make the order, you wait, you get it, and there's nothing in between. And so when I read scripture, what I don't see is that God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins so that we might be with him so that we could have a transactional relationship with him. What I see in the Bible is that he came to be with us and that we might be with him him. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is a communing between you and God. It is a communing. And that word, I use it intentionally because it's not a word we use very often, although we do it very often with a lot of things. But this, the word communing simply means a sharing of one's intimate thoughts or feelings with someone. It's a sharing of. It's a two-way street. It's a being with God. And this is where I get excited because I think with, um, when we think about being with God, we think, okay, that sounds good. That's a good churchy. It sounds good. Okay, God wants to be with us. No, no, no. We're, well, let's, go, let's dive deeper here. All right, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, this is a constant theme in the Bible. This is the theme of redemption, and prayer is a part of this. And so follow me here. When we, at the beginning of the Bible in the Old Testament, we see phrases like this all throughout the Old Testament. I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. My presence will go with you. Joshua chapter one says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. And then we turn the page into the New Testament when we see the ultimate be with you in the incarnation of Jesus in Matthew 1, 23. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. 
And then Jesus in Matthew 28 says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And Jesus in John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, verse three, which I read a couple weeks ago, it says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will be with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. And you, so this idea of communing with God is not just a, a momentary activity. When we pray, when we commune with the Lord, we are joining God in his redemptive story of all of scripture to be with the Lord. And so I think sometimes we grow up in this idea that praying is this before the meal thing, before bed thing, and a 911 call. And what we see in scripture is it's way more than that. It is joining God in the redemptive story of all of scripture. Because the end goal is that we would be with the Lord and that he would be with us. And so every time we pray, we are stepping into, we're leaning into the redemptive story that God would use us as followers of Jesus to bring redemption to every area of our life because he is with you. For the Christian, he is with you. This is the good news. We don't live a life just asking God, would you please be with me? No, no, no. Jesus said, I will pray to the Father that you get, he will give you a helper who will be with you always. And so what prayer actually is, is taking God up on his invitation to come and be with. He is with. And so this is the good news, that God didn't come to transact with us, but to be with us and live through us. So prayer, on your note page, prayer is a communing with God. Prayer is not transactional, but relational. And prayer is recognizing that God is with us. There is no praying, God, would you please be with me? He is with you if you are a follower of Jesus. In fact, what we do is we invite ourselves to say, hey, I wanna be with you in this moment. And so last week, I talked about temptation was an invitation to distrust God. This week, we're gonna talk about prayer as an invitation to trust God and commune with God. It's just Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus gives the invitation, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, watch me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. He's an inv inviting savior. It's not a checkbox. It's an invitation we accept. And he says, come, be with and you will find rest. So I'm not saying at any point, we will talk about this in a minute, that we should never ask. Jesus tells us to ask. The apostle Paul tells us, bring it all. But it's not just a wish list. It's a being with, it's a communing with the Lord. So let's get to our text, Luke chapter four. Here we go. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus, all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah, verse 42. At daybreak, Jesus came out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. So my first point this morning is that Jesus had a time and a place to pray. Verse 42, he says, at daybreak, Jesus was a morning guy, all right? At daybreak, he went out to a solitary place. I mean, think about the chaos of this moment, right? He had just gotten done healing a bunch of people. And now he's, he's left early daybreak. I'm, I gotta be by myself. I gotta go be with the Father. I need to connect and be with. And they came and found him, right? All the young moms in the room, you know this feeling. You try to get away and they will find you, right? They will. 
And Jesus knew it, but this is like another level of chaos. This is like Black Friday on steroids because this isn't the new flat screen TV you're trying to get a discount on. You're trying to find Jesus to heal your child. And so it's chaos. And in the midst of the chaos, Jesus still has a time and a place. He intentionally left the busyness of life to commune with his father. And this has looked different for me in different stages of my life. All right, what I don't wanna do this morning is give you a formula to say this is what you have to do. To me, what, what, what we see here is an intentionality to commune and be with the Lord. It could be for five seconds, it could be for 10 minutes, it could be for an hour, it could be whatever, but is the intentionality to connect and commune with the Lord. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, has modeled this. And so we as followers of Jesus, not just observers of Jesus, we are followers, we're gonna do the same. We're gonna intentionally be with the Lord. Luke chapter five, one chapter over is our next text. Luke chapter five, verse 14. Jesus has just healed a leper. And in verse 14 it says this, then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for the cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about Jesus spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. Verse 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. My second point this morning is that Jesus had a plan to pray. In Luke chapter one, Luke says, I am writing this gospel so that you may have an accurate account of what has happened. And so Luke is a detail guy. And so this word often in Luke six, in, in 16, in verse 16, is not by mistake. Luke was watching Jesus, lived with Jesus, traveled with Jesus, and he often got away. Jesus had a plan and he put it into practice. This was the intentionality lived out because the reality is if we say yes to one thing, we have to say no to something else. The other reality of this situation is that if we don't set our priorities, the urgent will always overtake the important. And so we have to have a plan. We have to go into our day as Jesus did saying, my plan today is to commune with God as often as possible before that meeting, before that decision, before whatever. It's a plan that Jesus had. I, I, I remember seeing this firsthand, not necessarily in the, in the area of prayer, but just the, in the area of being with, okay? So following here. So when I got uh, to, on staff here, I've had a lot of bosses over the years. But this one boss in particular, who's a great boss, um, he's a pretty, uh, he's, he's an introvert, all right? Pretty significant introvert. And uh, I remember when we were in one of those developmental conversations, I, he was coaching me up and, and helping me learn how to um, handle staff. And he told me something that just kind of, at first I was like, what? That seems really disingenuous. But then I'm like, but it's not. So what he does, he said, he goes, Andy, it's really important that you be with your people. And he said, so what I do, knowing myself as an introvert, he goes, I put it on my calendar to walk out of my office and walk the halls. Because if it was just up to me and I just listened to my wiring, I would just shut the door and stay in my office forever. But he said, it's important to go be with my people. And what was amazing was I had, I had seen him do this for a long time before we talked about it. And so what I saw him do is he didn't rush through it. He didn't just open his door, make one loop around the office area and then go back in. He would stop in every office and he would ask really good questions and he would listen and then ask really good questions back about what he heard. And so you knew he wasn't in a hurry. That being with you right now is his, what he wants to do. And that forever stuck out to me. Because I think sometimes when we think about prayer, we think about our wiring or maybe your Enneagram number or maybe your Myers-Briggs. Like, I'm not wired for that, Andy. So, no, no, no. It's, it's a matter of priority. Jesus made prayer a priority a communing with the Father, a priority. Maybe another way to look at this is like stewardship. I know we talk about stewardship with money a lot, but when we think about our time, when we think about our mental uh, effort, what we're letting into our eyes, what we're consuming all the time, like how are we stewarding the time that God has given us? 
when we see the time that Jesus had, he stewarded it and he made sure that part of that stewardship was to be with the Lord. And I think it's important for us to think about those things. So please hear me say this, the most important thing in your life is not your family, your friends, your relationship status, your job, your finances, or your health. The most important thing in your life is your personal intimacy with the Lord, and here's why. Because your personal intimacy with the Lord affects and shapes everything else in your life. Your personal intimacy or lack thereof shapes everything about you. How you view your job, how you view your relationships, how you handle your money, right? Like our relationship with the Lord affects everything else. My relationship with my wife affects every other relationship I have. I love my children, and my relationship with my children affects every other relationship I have. They are my priority. And so it affects how I spend my money. It affects how I spend my time. And rightly so, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, how we handle our relationship with the Lord affects everything else. All these things I mentioned are important. They probably take up a lot of our time and our energy, but they're not most important. So I wanna encourage us this morning to find a time and a place and then make a plan. If, if you're a scheduled person, put it in your calendar as if you're meeting with an actual physical person across the table, if that's what it takes. For me, it's changed all, through every season of my life. A lot of my communing with the Lord happens in my car because on my way to work and my way home from work, I can control the environment. I can turn off my phone and turn off the podcast or turn off the radio and just talk with the Lord. Luke 22 is our next text. Go all the way back to the end of the book. Verse 42, very short verse. It's a very familiar scene. We're coming up on Easter that we're gonna see. All right, it's Jesus and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's about to be crucified. And we see Jesus praying. Like I love these moments where we get to get a glimpse of Jesus, like wouldn't that be amazing to listen to Jesus pray? We'll get there in a second. Luke 22, verse 42, he simply prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. That's my third point, is that Jesus had a purpose in his prayer. Jesus had a purpose in praying. And ultimately, the purpose was, God, your will be done. You see, prayer, Prayer, prayer is communing, but it's communing with a purpose, and that is to shape our will to God's will. Like whatever God wants, whatever he's doing, whatever he cares about, whatever breaks his heart should break our heart. Whatever he's doing, I should be doing. And I think sometimes we get that twisted in, in terms of like we go to God and say, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring my resume before you, Lord. I'm gonna show you why you should do what I want. And it's the other way around. And we see Jesus do it right here. He says, this is what I'd like, but your will be done. What if we added that little phrase to the end of every prayer? God, I need help in this meeting. Here's what I would like to happen, but God, just your will be done. God, this is, this, in this relationship that I'm in, man, this is what I would like to happen. This is what I hope happens, but your will be done for your glory and my good. Because this is what we see Jesus do. And so his purpose in praying was simply to align himself with the Lord's will constantly, but your will be done. Is that the only purpose in prayer? Absolutely not. All right, we see a ton of other things that Jesus prays for. We see a ton of other things that people like Peter and Paul pray for. For instance, in Luke chapter six, Jesus prays before major decisions in choosing his disciples. In Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus pray for workers for a spiritual harvest. We see in John chapter 17 and Romans 8 that Jesus is praying for his disciples and for you and I. It's one of my favorites in John 17. You see that Jesus is praying for you. In Luke 22, while on the cross, we see Jesus pray that God would forgive those who are crucifying him, those who have hurt him, those who have let him down, those who are killing him. God, forgive them. In Matthew 26, we talked about this last week. We see Jesus tell his disciples pray to overcome temptation. In Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, we see Paul praying to spiritually strengthen other people, his friends. 
in one of my favorite prayers in Ephesians 6 and then in Colossians 4, 3, we see Paul pray that God would open doors that the mystery of Christ may be explained. Like there's a lot of reasons to pray. And if I didn't list anything that's interesting to you, let's go to Philippians 4, 6. Because Paul gives us the umbrella for prayer in Philippians 4, 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request before the Lord. So whatever you're walking through right now, bring it to the Lord. He's invited you, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, to be with me. You walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he wants to be with you. Are you living on the mountaintop? Great, he wants to be with you. Are you on a plateau of just normal days? He wants to be with you. That's the whole story of scripture is to be with the Lord. And Paul tells us, whatever it may be, in every situation, before that meeting, before that big decision, pray. Bring it before the Lord. And I just wonder if we just add, but your will be done. If I could be honest with you for a minute, my most common prayer that I pray, it is not eloquent. You may have been around people or grew up in a house where it was like very eloquent, like speech, speech that you never hear outside of a prayer moment. My, my most common prayer that I find myself praying multiple times daily is this, God help me. That's it. That's my most common prayer. Because I figure he knows. <laughs> he knows what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm walking into, what I'm leaving. And I was like, God help me. Before I go to coffee, God help me. Before I study God's word, God help me. Before I go home every day, God help me. <laughs> I wanna be the dad that you created me to be. I wanna be the husband you created me to be, but I know I'm tired and I'm irritable at five o'clock and I know they are too, so God help me. And so that drive home is a being with the Lord. I don't do it perfectly, I don't do it every day, but when I think about it, I do it. God help me. Our last, our last text this morning is Luke chapter 11. It's a very famous passage in Luke. It's, it's a little bit longer and more descriptive back in Matthew but it's chapter 11, verses one through four, and it's simply the Lord's Prayer. Let's read. Verse one, it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. And so my last point this morning is that Jesus taught a pattern to pray. When we don't know what to say, there's a pattern to pray. These aren't magic words, it's, 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 it's the intention that Jesus is teaching here. All right, the first thing that he does is he, he says, orient yourselves to whom you're praying with, worship the Lord. Lord, hallowed, holy is your name. You are Father, I am not. You are holy, I am not. We orient ourselves to whom we are praying. We remind ourselves that he is king. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And then in verse three, give us each our daily bread. Bring the need. What do you need? Bring it to him. Philippians 4, 6, in every situation, by prayer and petition, bring your request before the Lord. And then in verse four, I love it, it's two-sided. He says, hey, this is confession time. God, this is who I am. This is what I've done, this is what I've thought, this is what I've looked at, please forgive me. First John 1, 9, you, bring your, you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Jesus says, pray for forgiveness, confess your sin. And then while you're at it, pray that you can forgive those who have wronged you. In my mind, I think, God, help me see people the way you see them, especially those who have hurt me. Help me see them with compassion. Help me see them with grace. And help me see them extend mercy the way that you have extended grace and mercy to me. Because guys, we're all gonna screw up. We're gonna do things and say things that we don't mean or intend or it's gonna be seen the wrong way or felt the wrong way. And we're gonna want forgiveness in those moments. And Jesus says, hey, pray that you would forgive others too. And then in verse five, he says, and lead us not into temptation. And this is what we spent the whole week last week talking about, is that when Jesus modeled prayer, when he taught them how to pray, 
he included pray for the strength to fight temptation. To me, what this prayer practically sounds like is God, help me to trust you more than my feelings. Help me trust you more than my urges. Help me trust you more than my desires and my fears and my insecurities. Help me trust you. Because right now it's really hard. And so Jesus teaches us how to pray. Help me trust you more. So what we see here this morning is that Jesus had a time and a place. He had a plan that he practiced. He had a purpose and a pattern. A lot of P's this morning. A lot of alliteration. My English teacher would be very happy. A place, a plan, a purpose, and a pattern. And so as followers of Jesus, all we have to do is look at, at Jesus. We don't have to read some book on prayer, which there are wonderful books on prayer. I'm not, not knocking that. I've read them. But when we look at Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our King of God's kingdom, this is how he prayed. And this is what he said about prayer. And this is what he taught about prayer. So what do we do with this? What do we walk out of here today asking ourselves? I'm just gonna give you some challenges. They're not rocket science. I'm a simple guy and I like simple things. And so number one, pick a time and a place. How about today at lunch, you just, or maybe sometimes you just like, when is the best time for me? Maybe you're not a morning person, but you're a night owl. So maybe before bedtime, or maybe you're like me and life is crazy and you need to find little pockets of time and so it's your car. Maybe it's the first 10 minutes when you get into the office. You're gonna shut the door, turn the phone off, and pray. I was talking with my wife last night about this message, and, and she reminded me when we were uh, earlier in our parenting, when we had four under the age of five and a half, um, our time with the Lord was very different than when we were in college and single, right? And, and she said, you know, for, for a while there, it was really, I, she would, it was really frustrating because there was all these distractions, wonderful distractions, good distractions. And she said to me last night, she's like, for a while there, it was just in front of the coffee maker. And while, he was ma- while the coffee was dripping, I would just take a deep breath. God help me. And so maybe for you, that's where you start. Maybe your spot is right now in this season of your life for you young moms maybe is just in front of that coffee maker. Commune with the Lord. Be with him for a moment. For most of us, you could probably find some time. Because guys, if we're really honest, we commune with a lot of things. Like we are with Instagram a lot. We are with Netflix a lot. We are communing with content constantly. So maybe today we just start picking a time and a place. Share it with a friend, share it with your spouse, share it with your roommate. Say, hey, this is my time, this is my place. Ask me about it tomorrow. One day. Number two, plan it and practice it. Don't just pick a time and a place, plan it. Put it in your calendar. All right, write it on a sticky note in the shower. Write it on a sticky note in your car, whatever. Plan it and practice it. Number three, pray with purpose. And all this means is, like, know what we're doing when we say, this is God, this is what I want, but your will be done. Let that be the purpose of our prayers, is that whatever God's doing, he would turn it, that our hearts and our minds and our lives would be about what he is about. Because Romans 8 promises us that God will work all things out for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So even if it doesn't go the way you want, which I've had a lot of prayers in my life, not go the way I want. Big prayers. Romans 8 promises God will work it out for your good. And in the moment, it's hard to see that, believe me. But we trust. We trust the Lord and his word. So pray with a purpose, but your will be done. And then fourthly, just start praying. Just start. You don't need to have it perfect. You don't need to have a script. You don't need to, you know, get all whatever. Just start. Just start. God, help me. Help me want to pray. (laughs) God, help me. Help me before this meeting. God, help me. Like, just start. Like, when my kids started walking, never one time when they took the first step and then face planted was I like, oh my God. You are terrible at this. Like that never happened. That never happened. And for those of us who are not, like we're not used to praying, 
God is not saying like, man, that was, that was not good. That was, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, no. Like when, I, when our kids were walking, I was like, yes, let's go. All right, come on, let's take another one. And I think that's the heart of Jesus. It's like, hey, just, just take one step. Just start praying and then let's go. Let's be with each other and we'll do this together because from the story from the beginning to the end is that God would be with you and you would be with him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, just for your word. It's such an encouragement, but also a challenge. I love, God, how you decided in, in your scriptures to give us an example to follow. That Jesus didn't berate his disciples, he just taught them. God, I pray that you would help us as a church, that you would help us individually, that you would help us as small groups and as family units, that we would set aside time to be with you to pray your scriptures, to sing your songs and to read your word, that our hearts would be aligned with you. So God, we pray these things in your name, amen. Crossings, have a great day.